it's not going to be on the recording. All right, so I'll have to, I'll have to post a little note uh, on, um, on the on cue. Oh, the, the lecture slides and the link to the playlist are here. Uh, so as I finish updating the lecture slides for this year, I'll post them here. Um, and uh, hopefully this page will fill out very quickly. All right, so if there's no questions, I will just get, yeah. Unity app, sure. Uh, you won't need them though in the assignments. So the assignments you're going to get a project. Um, I mean, if you want to extend it for fun, absolutely, uh, and hand that in. Yeah, that would be that'd be cool to see what you guys can do with that. Um, okay, uh, the actual lecture. Okay, so the course is game development. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about game architecture in this um, lecture. Um, these slides uh, are from uh, Nick Graham, so I, I, any, uh, I've only made minor edits to most of them. I didn't make these. Um, creating an actual course from scratch takes an enormous amount of time. Usually people get time off to do it. Um, so because I'm a last minute substitute for this course, um, Nick's just giving me his lecture slides. Uh, and for the most part, I'm just going to go with them. Uh, C on Q. Okay, not C1, C on Q. That's autocorrect there. Okay, so what are the elements that make up a modern game? So this is only a small list. Uh, this is only a partial list of what actually goes into a modern, uh, modern AAA game, right? So one of these big splashy games uh, consists of, well, at least these parts and many, 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 many more, right? So you can see there's AI, so it's not true artificial intelligence, right? It's you need to, in your game, you need to be able to make the things in your game, well, depending on what type of game you're making, you need to be able to make them move or react somehow to what the player is doing, right? That falls under the term AI in, um, in the literature. Physics, so if you're making a game that involves stuff moving around, um, the stuff moving around, you have to figure out, well, how am I gonna move it around, right? What happens when stuff that's moving around hits other stuff that's moving around? That all falls under the, the term game physics. Sound is a big part of modern games, um, arguably almost as important as the, as the graphics itself. Right? Networking is important in multiplayer games. Right? So any game that involves more than one computer has to be networked somehow. Right? And so that is a big, big part of modern games. Um, of course, there's the interface to the game itself, whether you're using a controller or a keypad and mouse, or if it's on your phone and you're doing something with your phone, Right, uh, there's the user interface that you have to worry about. There is the rendering part. So the rendering part, how do you produce the drawing or how do you produce the, um, the figure that's on your screen, right? So that is uh, covered in CISC 454. Well, sorry, it's not covered. That is uh, a topic for CISC 454, right? Again, in 454, you only get a little bit of what actually goes into modern graphics, right? You get the fundamentals, but there is so much more that, you, uh, that they're left to learn um, that can't be covered in one course, two courses. I would argue you couldn't cover it in 10 university courses. Right? That's how big many of these um, topics are. Right? Uh, animation, right? Uh, how do you make things move? Right? Uh, again, that's often a separate graphics course uh, if a, the university offers it. Right? And again, you only touch on the basics of animation. Uh, there's a scripting interface. So most, most, yes, so most modern games, um, they, are the, they are programmed in a quote unquote scripting language, right? So in Unity, you know that C Sharp is the scripting language, even though it's actually compiled, right? Um, many games can be, you can change the programming of the game uh, via the uh, scripting interface, right? There's asset creation. You would typically go off and do an entire college degree. Uh, to do uh, the asset creation, right? The graphical design. Um, sorry, the 3D modeling of 3D or 2D modeling of stuff in your game, right? And there's so much more that goes into a modern game engine. Um, the amount of software that's written for these things is enormous, right? It's um, what's bigger. Um, like you're talking like it's on the order of something like the entire Microsoft Office suite, right? Or bigger in a modern game engine. Oh, so anyway, we can't talk about everything. We're gonna focus mostly on uh, AI, physics, and networking in this course. Uh, 
we're only going to touch on them uh, as well. Okay, so uh, what goes into a very basic, well actually this, so I meant to edit this slide and insert one in front of this slide. So uh, if you go back and look at some of the very first computer games that showed up, uh, this picture is not accurate. So the, for the first computer games that showed up, there was basically this component, oops, sorry, called the game, and that's it. So basically, you would write one file, maybe, um, and that would contain everything you needed for this one game, right? So um, if you've seen Pong, Pong's written, it's basically it's a few hundred or a few thousand lines of code, and that's it, right? And that was your game. Everything that you needed for this game would go into this one file, right? If you needed to make a different game, you would have to throw everything away and start from scratch and build it up again, right? And that's fine as long as your game is small-ish, right? But as soon as you try to uh, make anything bigger and you want to be able to do something reusable, you have to change the way uh, that you architect your game, right? And that was supposed to be uh, what you learned in your third year um, course, which I can't remember now. 326 or something like that, right? The software, uh, the software course for the third year software course for the game for the game development stream. Okay, so in the basic game, uh, so this is a simple simplified pi picture of what a uh, modern game might sort of look like. Um, you'd have this component called the game, right? That would include all of the logic related to your game. Right? What does the game need to do? Well, you can imagine you're making a game. It's, uh, the player has to interact with the computer somehow. So you need some sort of, in the, your game needs to be able to perform some sort of input. Right? It either needs to read the keyboard and the mouse or it needs to use a controller. Again, if you have a cell phone, it needs to be able to access the cell phone user, uh, user interface. Right? Furthermore, whoa, yeah, furthermore, oh wait, is it not showing up there? Am I just blind or is it? Oh, okay. Um, uh, so furthermore, uh, if you're making a modern game, um, the odds are pretty good that you're going to be targeting more than one type of uh, platform, right? You might have a PC version, you might have a Xbox version, you might have a Sony version, you might have a cell phone version, right? You might have a Wii version, uh, sorry, a Nintendo version, and so on and so on and so forth, right? You don't want a separate input manager for every version. Right? It'd be nice if there was one. Same thing with the rendering, right? So when you go to draw stuff in your game, right, um, and you are targeting your game to multiple different platforms, you don't want to have to write a different, uh, you don't have, want to have to write different code for every different platform. That would really suck. That's the way we used to do it, not so long ago, actually, right? So probably as little as 10 years ago, right? Uh, if you were making a game for Xbox, you would have a completely separate team for Sony as well, right? And another team for Windows, um, and so on and so on and so forth, right? Modern game engines, they abstract all of the platform-specific stuff away, uh, and you can write more or less one body of code that works for all different platforms, right? So your game component is going to call the rendering engine to draw stuff, right? And your rendering engine, oops, Right, then calls some display component to actually display the, um, uh, to actually display uh, the uh, game. Right. The input manager is similar, right? Your game is going to call the input manager to get input for your game, right? The player input for your game, right? Your player, your input manager is actually going to then call some sort of platform specific uh, controller to actually get that input. Yep. Right. Okay. So in a networked game, um, you need to somehow connect your game up to somebody else or some other uh, players who are also playing the same game. Right? And so what that means is, is that you need to share information about the current game state. Right? And so your game component reads and writes the game state out to another. Uh, so the game state is managed by another component. Right? That game state might be communicated to other instances of the game uh, over the network. Right? Okay, and of course there's also sound, right? And you can keep on adding to this picture um, over and over and over again, right? So your game, if it has sound, and all modern games do have sound, 
right? It's going to, whenever it needs to play a sound, it's going to call the sound engine. The sound engine is then responsible for actually calling the necessary software and, uh, and hardware to actually produce the sound. Right. Okay, then still more, right? So um, as I mentioned before, back in the old days, if you were to write a game, everything would be uh, more or less in a, uh, there'd be one component, right? Your game would include everything it needs, right? And so in modern games, right, because uh, people have realized that there's a lot of commonality between games, even in games that look very different, um, it makes sense to put all these things into separate components, right? So the physics, so handling collisions, how things move around in the world, right? how they behave to things like gravity or simulated gravity in your world, right? All of these fall under the umbrella of physics. Uh, typically in a modern game, these all fall, the responsibility for handling all of this computation falls to the physics engine. Right? Similarly, uh, if your game is composed of things other than the player, right, you need to build in some sort of, again, quote unquote, artificial intelligence uh, to make those things other than the player react to how the, what the player is doing. Right? Again, there's lots of, um, commonality between games, again, games that are very different even, uh, all of that stuff is managed by the artificial intelligence component. Okay, so why do we do all this? Well, it's all because of, now that we know more about software development, uh, is you want separation of concerns, right? And this other thing called information hiding. Again, these are terms you should have seen at some point by now. If you haven't, we've gone wrong somewhere in your education, right? So separation of concerns, this should all be review, right? You want to split a problem into self-contained units, right? Each unit is responsible for some aspect of the problem, right? Physics component, responsible for the physics of the game, right? AI component, it's responsible for the AI, right? So in a modern game engine, all of these things are separated into separate components, right? Uh, this simplifies the programming, of, uh, well, sorry, does it simplify? It doesn't really simplify the program. It simplifies creating the game, right? Creating the actual components is still very hard, but it simplifies programming from the game creator's point of view, right? Similarly, the people who are making the individual components, they don't necessarily need to know about the other components, right? So your AI, people working on AI-like problems probably don't care about sound, right? People working on sound probably don't care about physics and so on and so on and so forth. Sometimes there's some overlap, so the people making those components have to realize, have to figure out how are we gonna handle this overlap with these other components, right? Uh, and of course, as soon as you can split everything up uh, into separate concerns, this lets you, uh, this lets individual teams work on all the separate components. Right. There's also this uh, notion of information hiding uh, this is a this is a UML diagram that's trying to illustrate the concept. It's not the greatest. So, does this diagram make sense to you guys? Have you actually seen a diagram like this before? Okay, so yeah. All right. So your third year course, something's gone wrong in your third year course. Anyway, um, you might have seen a course. So if you took 124, you may have seen a figure that sort of looks like this. All right. So what's going on here? That round ball with the line and the box. So that box represents a component. The line with the round ball is uh, the UML notation, UML Unified Modeling Language. So that's the notation for describing an interface. Right? 124, you learned about Java interfaces, right? So that idea carries over to other programming languages as well, right? The interface is just the publicly viewable in an object-oriented sense, methods that belong to this object, right, that are defined by the interface, right? The interface says these methods exist, right? Uh, that cup there and that other component up there, right, uh, that cup indicates that A uses that interface, right? So in other words, A is trying to talk to B, right, via B's interface. That's all that picture is trying to show you, right? They really should have done that in 326. Anyway. Uh, so when you're building these components, um, and you will have known this, I think, uh, well, you will have seen this when you went to use these things, right? You realize that all of these components have a API or documentation, 
right? The documentation is just describing the interface. Uh, and so the way this works is that you write the interface, you create the interface, right? And then that component there becomes pluggable, right? As long as you have another component, call it C, that has the same interface, you can swap B out for C, right? You can swap C in for B, right? Or D in for B, and so on and so on and so forth, right? As long as the components all have the same interface, they become interchangeable, um, and that's nice. So someone can, for example, right, make the Sony rendering component here, somebody else can make the Xbox rendering component, somebody else can make the PC rendering component, they all have the same interface, right? You can swap them in and out as necessary. Or your game engine can swap them out as necessary when it goes to build the game for the particular uh, platform. Right, that's all of that. Okay, and so this lets uh, you um, reuse components. And so this is the big difference between a modern game and a game from back in the 70s or 80s. Right, everything in the 70s or 80s, you write this game and that's it. Right? You want to make a new game, you start from scratch. You might be able to copy code from your other game uh, and repurpose it. Probably not. Right? If you wanted to make a very different game, you're screwed. You're rewriting the second game, your new game, all on your own. Right? Um, but once you, have these, um, once you have these separate components with well-defined interfaces, right, you can now start to reuse all of these things over and over and over again. And that's nice, right? So for example, right? So for your rendering component, this is the thing that's responsible for, uh, that lets the programmer draw stuff to the screen, right? You might use something like Ogre. Ogre is an open source um, 3D rendering platform. Um, so uh, Ogre takes care, Ogre lets a programmer write code that can uh, describe a three-dimensional scene, and it will render it uh, to the screen using uh, whatever um, lower level software is used by that platform, right? So for example, Ogre supports Windows, it supports Mac, it supports Linux, uh, a bunch of cell, I think cell phone stuff, and pretty much everything else, uh, every other major computing uh, platform out there, right? And so it lets the, it abstracts everything the programmer needs about rendering into something, right? So it describes the scene with something called the scene graph, right? All of the material properties of stuff in your scene are abstracted away, right? And it handles the rendering for you. So write one piece of software, it runs on any platform that Ogre supports, right? Now, how does Ogre work? Well, Ogre, there's another level under that. Right? And so Ogre needs to know how does a PC uh, render stuff to the screen, how does an Xbox render stuff to the screen, right? And so Ogre needs to know about things like OpenGL or DirectX, Vulkan, um, and anything else that's kicking around, right, for the platform that it's uh, trying to render to, right? But the idea is, is that the programmer can use the rendering component without having to care about the lower level stuff. The lower level stuff, so the OpenGL, that's what you learn about in CISC 454, right? So OpenGL is a standard, um, it's a standard uh, library uh, for, that supports low level rendering, right? So how do you draw a triangle? Or how do you draw a point? How do you draw a line? And things like that, right? And so OpenGL, open graphics language, um, is one of these, uh, is one of the pieces, sorry, one of the frameworks that you can use um, for uh, graphics. DirectX is Microsoft's, uh, Vulkan is the replacement for OpenGL. I'm not sure what Apple uses. Um, and there, there will be different, so Android's probably OpenGL, um, and so on and so on and so forth. Right. So for input, input's the same thing, right? You wanna write a game, you wanna target multiple platforms. Uh, all the platforms are very different in how they get their inputs, right? Even a Sony PlayStation and an Xbox, even their controllers are different. Right? And so you don't want to have to write different controller software for all of your games, right? Um, it would be nice, I can write software once, runs on any um, platform, right? And so uh, the input, one of the most common input libraries is something called SDL. What is it? I can't remember what it stands for anymore. Uh, 
um, but it abstracts all sorts of inputs on uh, modern computers. So mouse, keyboard, joystick. Uh, it does graphics and sound as well. So SDL is pretty comprehensive. All of it becomes platform independent, right? You call SDL, SDL deals with the platform, in, uh, platform dependent stuff. Right? Sound in a game, uh, so OpenAL is one. Um, what's the other one? The other one's in my web browser. Anyway, um, OpenAL is the open audio language. So it's sort of the companion to OpenGL, open graphics language, right? Uh, it deals with placing sound in a 3D world uh, and uh, when you play that sound over your speakers, it provides the illusion of it having some sort of placement in the world, right? Finally, physics, uh, these are just three. These are probably the three big ones. Uh, OD having, yeah, that probably makes sense. Uh, physics has a different name now, I think. Anyway, um, so the physics component is the thing that deals with motion um, in a, uh, or motion in a 3D, typically in a 3D world, they also do 2D. Right. And so if you have something moving in the world, if it's going to interact with other things in the world, you need to be able to do things like collision detection. Right. You need to be able to know uh, or be able to compute how is this thing moving. Right. How is it responding to individual forces that are, uh, that are acting on the objects. Right. All of this stuff is abstracted by the physics engine. Right. The physics engine then does the calculations needed to update the positions of everything in the world, tell you whether or not something's collided. Right, and then it reports that information back to the programmer. Uh, so we'll be doing, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about how the physics engine actually works in a modern game. Right, and finally, there's the game engine itself. Right, and so you can see that um, we haven't described everything that goes into a modern game engine, but there's already a lot of components flying around. Right, what a modern game engine does is it takes uh, many, it takes lots and lots and lots of these components and sticks it all into one place. Right, so Unity has um, all of these things built into it somehow, right, to some extent. Um, and if it doesn't have it built in, it has a mechanism for adding extra stuff to it, right? And so Unity's AI, um, built-in AI stuff is, uh, it only supports, I think, it, as far as I know, it only supports one main type, right? It supports state machines, right? But you might want to do other types of AI, so things like behavior trees, right? Those aren't natively supported by Unity. Someone else can write a component, though, plug that into Unity, uh, and away you go, right? And so uh, your game engines, uh, so Unity is the one we use in this course. Um, Unreal, uh, what's the, I can't remember what the other one. Un Unreal, what's the, what's the other big one that's, uh, that's used? It's not Unreal, it's, um, you can tell this, was a, this slide was done a long time ago. Uh, it escapes my, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, there's an important one missing here. Anyway, um, what the game engines do is they, pr they take all of these components, package it up into one place, provide extensibility if you need it, uh, and that lets the programmer uh, not have to worry about any system specific stuff. Um, so that they can focus on creating their game rather than worry about how the heck do I draw this thing on my PC as opposed to how the heck do I draw this thing um, on my Xbox, right? Okay, so uh, if you're using a game engine, the picture changes a little bit. Your game component now exists, uh, does not, does not directly call the rendering engine or the input manager or the sound engine or the physics engine, right? Instead, it calls the game engine, right? And the game engine deals with, okay, so what, where does this request actually have to go to, right? So if the game decides it needs to update the physics, it asks the game engine to update the physics and the game engine calls whatever physics component is appropriate um, uh, uh, for the purpose. Okay. So I think that's, uh, I'll stop that there today. The rest of this is not super important. Have you seen a scene graph before? Yes, no, no, probably not, I'm guessing not. So this picture isn't accurate either. Uh, this is the simplest type of scene graph there is. Um, so um, eventually you're gonna have to, it would probably be useful for you if you actually understood what a scene graph was. So a scene graph is a, it's probably the most common way now of representing 
the stuff in what's called a scene, right? So the stuff in the scene, so here's a simple example of a, well, this is just a vehicle, right? It can be any vehicle, it doesn't have to be a tank, right? But there's some object here called a tank, right? And that tank is made up of sub-objects. Each one of those sub-objects might be made up of other sub-objects, right? So this tank here has its body, right? And then on top of the body, it has a turret, right? The gun, the main gun, right? And on top of the main gun, there's another machine gun, right? And so that little picture there, which looks like a graph, right? It's binary here, it doesn't have to be binary, right? And a scene graph is typically not binary. Right? Uh, that little graph there describes the, relation, the hierarchical relationship of that object. Right? Game object is made up, so the tank's made up of a body and the turret, the turret's made up of the main gun and the machine gun, so on and so on and so forth. Right? When you go to move this thing around in the world, right, and you'll learn this in 454, right? so when you move the tank, you want to move the whole tank. Right? Now as the tank is moving, you can imagine the turret pivots. Right? And so to draw the whole tank, right, you first apply whatever transformations you need to move the tank in the world. Right? Anything you do here applies here. Right? So the transformation that you apply to your, your tank object applies to its body. And it also applies to the turret. Right? Now if you want to turn the turret, right, you apply another transformation here. So as that turret turns, right, anything that happens here now applies to these things here, right? And now if you want your machine gun to turn, right, you apply a separate transformation here, right? And so the overall transformation that happens to the machine gun is the transformation that happens here, then the transformation that happens there, followed by the transformation that happens there, right? And so creating these hierarchies turns out to be very useful uh, when you actually get into uh, some 3D rendering of stuff. Okay, and so there's a little, again, this is another UML diagram of a simple scene graph, right? So every game object carries with it some sort of geometrical transform, right? And every game object has one or more children, zero or more children, right? And those will be your, uh, the children of the note, sorry. Right? So that'll have two children, this has two children, and so on and so on and so forth. Okay, right. When you call the update method on the game object, right, whatever transformation happens to the game object gets applied to all of the ch child objects, right. When you call update on the child objects, right, whatever happens to whatever transform applies to the child object applies to all of the children of the children of the child object, and so on and so on and so forth, right. If the tank collides with something, right, that collision also applies to all of its children and all of the children's children and so on and so on and so forth. Okay, and there's finally there's the frame loop. So the way a modern game works is basically it runs in an infinite loop, right? You start your game and it just loops and it waits for user input, right? There could be other stuff depending on how your game is structured, right? So there might be some opening cinematic and that might take you to a menu and then so on and so forth. Eventually you end up in the main game. The main game is just a loop. Right? And so inside that loop, this is a very simplified version of this loop, right? Basically you're reading what is the player doing, right? You update the game state according to what the player is doing, right? And then you draw the updated game state, right? Repeat and keep on going until the game ends at some point, right? How does it actually read the inputs or update the game state? Well, to read the inputs, it's gonna call the input manager, right? to draw stuff, it's gonna call your rendering engine, right? To update the game state, it's going to call the game state component to update that, right? Because this thing runs in a loop, it's just an infinite loop, right? On a modern game, you're typically aiming for 60 frames per second or something like that. This loop has to be fairly fast, right? Uh, and that's actually a big part of these rendering engines, right? How do you draw these things fast and how do you uh, whatever AI updates you need to make, how do you do those quickly, right? Because you have to make all of this run at real time in a, in a game, right? So this loop has to be very tight, 
right? It has to be very fast in its execution. Right? Anything that's slow, right, you somehow have to deal with that. Right? So network communication is slow compared to, seems fast, but it's slow compared to what you're, uh, compared to the computation that's going on to actually draw a frame of your game. Right? And so you have to, when you talk about network games, you somehow have to deal with, well, this network communication is slow. How do I deal with that when I have a fast paced moving game? Right? And you probably all know about things like lag and things like that. Right? Ping time, lag, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? These are all things that a modern game has to deal with. All right, that's um, the basic introduction to what we're gonna be doing in the course. Uh, I guess in the next lecture, uh, we're gonna expand a little bit on this. Um, you can start the first reading whenever you want. Um, oh, the one thing I met, forgot to mention about the readings. So the readings will, um, will usually have a set of review questions for you at the end, right? These are mostly questions like to test whether or not, not to test, to assess whether or not uh, you've done the reading and understood it, right? Uh, the exam is going to cover the readings as well as the course content, right? So it is important that you do the reading at some point. Um, and so I recommend that you try to keep pace with the readings in the course, right? The date, the suggested due dates are on the, are on, on cue. All right, so I'll see you next day. <laughs>